10 years ago on September 19th, I was just your regular 21 year old college student. I was living away from home and getting ready for work. It was a Tuesday morning and I got a phone call from my mom and I answered and she very calmly said, Katie, it's your dad, he's very sick and we're taking him to the hospital by ambulance. That wasn't the first time that I'd had a phone call like that and my dad had been very sick since about 2000 and he had been in and out of the hospital um, so I quickly grabbed my things called into work and drove home and met my mom and dad at the hospital um, my dad was not the kind of person to complain if he said something hurt you knew that it hurt really badly and when I walked into the triage room I saw my dad in the worst pain I'd ever seen anyone in. He was thrashing and flipping from side to side trying to get comfortable and just crying out for somebody to give him medicine and um, there was nothing we could really do at that point. My mom pulled me aside and said they think that it's his kidneys. On Friday we found out one of his kidneys didn't work and over the weekend he started having just a lot of symptoms and we think that his other kidney has now shut down. And my immediate response was, oh, that's fine. I can donate a kidney. You know, people live without kidneys all the time, and it'll be fine. There's dialysis, and there's all sorts of treatments. And my mom just was like, no, this, this is different. Something's really wrong. Um, and within, I don't know, 12 to 24 hours, he was in um, multi-organ failure, and things were looking really grim. On, I guess, what would have been the second day that he was there, the doctors had stabilized him enough to do dialysis, um, which is exactly what they said he needed in order to survive. And my mom and I left while they did the treatment, and we came back to find just a new person. He wasn't in any more pain, he had good color, he was talking and in a better mood even, um, and just more like himself. And it was just this vision of relief you know, like, okay, he's gonna get through this just like he's gotten through everything else. And so we had agreed that we, mom and I would go home and get some rest because we were in for a long recovery. So normally when my dad had been in the hospital, I would just say, see you later, you know, love you, bye, be back tomorrow. Never made a big deal out of leaving the hospital because I just, I didn't wanna make it this emotional scene every time. Um, but that night as I was standing there, I just really felt completely overwhelmed to go and hug my dad and to tell him that I loved him. And when I first kind of felt that, I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Like, I'm just gonna say, see you later, <laughs> like I always did. And again, this little voice was saying, you need to hug your dad and tell him that you love him. And I, I remember just thinking, okay, well, what, what can it hurt? And I walked up to him and I did, I gave him a hug and I looked him in the eyes and I said, I love you, dad. And mom and I are gonna get some rest at home and we'll be back first thing in the morning. And I love you and get some sleep. And my mom and I left. Um, we went home and got settled in. It was about 10 maybe 11 in the evening, and I just happened to sleep on the couch that night. And probably about 11, 15, I remember the phone ringing. And I answered the phone, it's a nurse from the hospital, and she's saying, um, Katie, you and your mom need to come back to the hospital. Your dad's not doing well at all. And you guys need to get here as soon as you can. And like I said, my dad had been in the hospital a lot, and at one point he had been a very naughty patient and been very hard to calm down. He would get really agitated, and the nurses would have to call a family member to come and help calm him down. And So I was just thinking, oh, he must be really agitated, and they need us to come and calm him down. But my mom knew. She knew what was happening, and she knew that nurses don't call you in the middle of the night to come back to the hospital for nothing. 
And so the whole time we drove, you know, we lived 20 minutes away. The whole time we drove, you know, she was very somber. And she said at one point, um, you know, when your dad dies, Katie, I, I'm going to need some time to myself. And I was like, don't talk like that. And the movie Ring of Fire was out at the time. And we had the soundtrack, so we... I forced her to listen to Johnny Cash songs all the way to the hospital because I just didn't want to think worst case scenario. So we get to the hospital and get up to the ICU floor and we walk in and at this point it's just a little past one, I think, and um, we're greeted by a nurse and she ushers us into this little room and I just remember walking towards it thinking it was no big deal and then realizing my mom wasn't beside me anymore. And I turned around and she was just cowering like a, like a child. And it was, that was when I started to realize like this is not good. Something is really wrong and I went and grabbed her and she was saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I was saying, yes, you can, because we're going to do this together. And I'll be right here the whole time. And so I held on to her and helped her to the room and we sat down and it was just silent. And again, I was still just trying to be Miss Optimistic and thinking, okay, they just have us in this room because it's late at night. They need us to be quiet. And I remember looking at all the, um, pictures and things on the walls and there were all these poems of like in memory and about when people die and that's when it started to sink in. They don't put you in this little room just because it's late and they want to keep you quiet. This is the room that they tell you your loved one is gone. And it wasn't but a couple minutes after they put us in the room that the doctor walked in and I'll never forget his voice or his words that he just said, Mary Catherine, Katie, we did everything we could. And he, I, I remember, you know, my mind starts thinking a million things and I can kind of hear his voice as like a, I don't know, it was kind of ethereal almost. And him trying to explain to us that he had gone into fatal arrhythmia and that they worked on him for 45 minutes and they tried and tried and tried to keep him here and they just couldn't. And my very first thought was I needed him. And, um, and then I just cried. I cried like I'd Never, ever cried before. I mean, I cried so loud. I didn't care who heard me. The whole hospital could have heard me for all I know. My mom was weeping, and it was just us. And um, it was a really powerful moment because I would lost a lot of people that I loved in my life before, but never somebody that I was this close to. And just that realization that, you know, this curtain is closed now and there's no coming back. The, the barrier has been sealed. Um, that was a pretty tough moment. As the minutes passed, um, you know, we had called some family while we were on the way and, you know, they were beginning to show up and I remember very distinctly having kind of this vision in my mind. And I I was young, you know, I was 21 at the time and I didn't know how to handle this sort of grief and so this picture kind of appeared in my mind of kind of worst case scenario, how I would handle this grief. And it was me just losing it, just kind of losing my faith, losing any care in the world, and just trying to 
to fill a void with whatever I could, alcohol or drugs or, you know, just kind of wasting my life. And it was like as soon as that picture kind of fully developed in my mind, it was almost like God shut a book and said, that's not how this is going to be. And I remember hearing God say, if you will trust me in this, then I will show you that these are the moments that make your faith strong. And these are the moments that will make you strong. Um, and I, I kind of was puzzled a little bit at what, what I was hearing. And I just said, okay. God, I trust you. I trust you in this. And whatever you say, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to trust that you're going to get me and my mom through this. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew that in that moment, the worst thing that had ever happened in my life a big worst thing, not just, you know, my boyfriend broke up with me or, you know, I didn't get the job I wanted, but like my dad just died kind of out of nowhere. Um, the absolute worst thing that had ever happened to me at that point. And I knew I had to trust God in it because without him, I saw the picture of what could have been or what might have been. And I didn't want that for myself. I had been a believer for a long time already and you know, I didn't want to let go of everything I'd ever been taught, everything I'd ever um, believed. But this was the time that it was, it was my chance to put aside the, the theology, the theory, and to actually live it and to experience what God means when he says trust me you know i have great plans for you trust me um and that was a big revelation in my faith i didn't realize it at the time but as years passed and i kept reflecting on that prayer and how i just clung to god in that moment i realized for the first time that was when i really heard god's voice and it didn't start there. I had been hearing his voice for a long time and and the Holy Spirit had been with me, but I had never recognized him. Um, and so that was, you know, kind of what I like to call my awakening of sorts, you know, that I finally realized that God's speaking to us all the time through the Holy Spirit and we've got to have ears to listen. And it, it took that kind of grief for me to be able to hear. Um, but since then, I think I've been more, I don't know what the word is, but receptive. You know, that it's not just this little, not, not my conscience talking to me. It's not just the little voices in my head. But it's God. God telling me and being with me just like he says he is in the Bible. God living in me through the Holy Spirit and guiding me, comforting me. Um, but what I thought was neat was that I had all, you know, after I kind of came to this realization that, wow, this is really the first time I recognized God's voice, that it wasn't actually that moment that I feel like I really first heard God's voice. It was actually in the hospital room when... I saw my dad live for the last time because as I mentioned, that was not my nature to make a big deal about, about leaving the hospital. Not at all. And I didn't want to obey that little voice, but I'm glad I did because I realize now it was the Holy Spirit nudging me to hug my dad, tell him I love him one last time so that I could have that memory forever. But the last words I said to my dad were, I love you. And had I not listened to the Holy Spirit, you know, it would have been funny. But my last words would have been, see that, peace out. 
which would have been fun too, I guess. But I'm so grateful to have had that moment and to have locked eyes with him and had that very distinct moment of, I love you. I'll see you soon. The last 10 years, I feel like it should be kind of like a Broadway dramedy. <laughs> the last 10 years have been wild. They've been really wild. Um, first of all, that means I'm 31. So <laughs> getting older is harder. Um, <clears throat> the last 10 years have been an interesting journey. I would definitely say the weeks and months after my dad passed, you know, I was just dealing with grief. And I never, I don't know, I, I couldn't see in that moment how things could ever get better. Because even though I understood that my dad was in heaven and I had hope to see him again and that, you know, everything was going to be okay, it didn't feel okay. And I didn't see how I could ever get through a day without grief. Um, but 10 years later, I won't say that you necessarily get over it or anything, but I remember hearing somebody say that losing a loved one is like losing a limb. You know, like you lose an arm or a leg. You know, you can live, you continue to go on and you can function without it, but you feel like there's always something missing. And that's, that's kind of how the last 10 years have felt. You know, I graduated college, I got married, had two beautiful little girls. And while all those things have been really happy, it always goes through my mind that my dad's not here with me to experience it himself on earth. And um, so in a way, some of those happy memories have been, I won't say tainted, but kind of hazy, almost. I remember when Malia was born, she had um, she had this little birthmark on her eye and one on her, the back of her neck. And, you know, I didn't really think much of it, but, you know, I, I had been really sad about having a baby without my dad being there and, you know, just wishing he could be there. And, um, a nurse came in and mentioned the birthmarks or the little spots and she said oh yeah this one up by the eye we call that an angel kiss and it was kind of like this reminder of you know my dad is present in my life maybe not physically but you know I think about him all the time I, I have lots of great memories and um, I think about how he would have loved Blake my dad was a big history nerd and I think a lot about how Blake is a lot like my dad and I'm a lot like my mom <laughs> and um, you know I try not to think too much about what might have been you know oh what would it be like if my dad was here but just more or less trying to figure out how to go about the rest of my life and not forget him but also not just for myself but like for my girls how to teach them about who he was as a person and you know let his memory live on even in them a few weeks ago our music pastor asked me and blake to do a song and i was like scouring the internet for duets and i found this song that i heard a long time ago called your cries have awoken the master and i've forgotten how much i loved it and blake and i were practicing it a couple of days ago or I was listening to it a couple of days ago and it just hit me like a ton of bricks like the day we're singing this song is September 18th and in my world September 18th 10 years ago in 2006 was kind of the last day of my life as I knew it because September 19th was when my dad was rushed to the hospital and never came home um, and this song is just such a perfect picture of the experience that I had losing my dad and then also um, being able to glorify God through it because, you know, the chorus says, you've prayed all night, you've held on with all of your might, your cries 
have awoken the master. And that's exactly what I always tell people about when the day that my dad died was also the day that a part of me spiritually came alive that I'd never known before. And, and in a way, I feel like I did kind of awake the master. I, I, he, the Holy Spirit was always there, but it was like I could see him all of a sudden. And, you know, so this song is just such a, a great tribute. I had been just all year I've been thinking, how can I make this 10 year anniversary special? And this song is how, because it is such a testament to what I've experienced, how God has been there for me in the storms of my life. And how not only did he just save me, you know, not only did he just rescue me from a difficult situation, but he opened my eyes so that I could glorify him and so that I could be there to minister to other people who go through similar experiences the way that other people ministered to me. The disciples were getting concerned The wind started violently blowing He was asleep at the stern Does he not care that we perish? 